And we are live. Good afternoon and welcome to today's program, Retail Trends and Strategies. My name is Kate Gilbride and I'm the Associate Director of Events and Partnerships at the Golden Triangle Bid. Throughout the COVID-19 crisis, your businesses have been quickly adapting. From increasing online sales to shifting to delivery and pickup orders, we know you've all been working hard to stay in operation while keeping your customers and employees safe. And you are getting ready to adapt once again as DC prepares to enter phase one of reopening this Friday. I will be providing more information on phase one of reopening at the end of this webinar. Today's webinar will highlight trends and forces in both the retail and food and beverage industry, some of which are already changing the retail landscape before COVID-19 and will continue to have an impact on business. We will also discuss how Golden Triangle stores, eateries, barbershops, and the like can boost business practices to survive and carry on post-pandemic. All participants are automatically muted to reduce background noise, and your video is turned off, but you can still ask questions of our presenter. You can submit questions throughout the presentation by clicking the questions or chat dropdown on your control panel on the right of your screen typing your question into the box and clicking send. We will then go over these questions at the end of the program. Now, I'd like to introduce you to Kelly Cost from retail strategy firm, Downtown Works, who will lead our webinar today. Kelly, please introduce yourself to our audience. Great, okay, so good morning, everyone. And just give me a moment here to screen share. Okay. Should be in screen share mode now. Uh, yes, we look like we're good. Someone would tell me if we weren't. So uh, yeah, again, uh, thanks for joining this afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Kelly Cost. I'm a retail strategist with Downtown Works. We're a small firm based in Seattle and we work in downtowns of all sizes across the country. Um, in the past, I have run retail stores as well as a restaurant. And um, so I, I do have firsthand experience in these worlds. And I'm also involved with a few organizations like the Urban Land Institute and the International Downtown Association. In just a moment here, I'm gonna go to full screen and actually turn off my camera. Okay, lay, so great, so now we're in full screen here. Um, so I'm really pleased to be able to share some information with you today that I hope you'll find useful as you move forward with your business. I'm gonna be covering three different sections. Um, the first is kind of on overall trends and forces that are affecting retail and food and beverage, um, a lot of it before the crisis and continuing through. Uh, the second is going to cover tactics and tools getting through this crisis. Um, you know, in, in the near term. And the third is about the exterior and interior look and feel of your business. Uh, lastly, we're gonna move into a question and answer session. So to start, uh, trends and forces in the world of retail and restaurants. There are several large operators that have very recently declared bankruptcy. Um, and the consensus is that Sears may be also on its last legs. A number of the B and C malls could close up very soon, and the A malls will each lose at least one anchor. Uh, this makes things really tough for the other stores that remain in malls as spaces go dark and less traffic comes into the mall. Uh, the dire state for malls and large retailers was occurring before the crisis, but the decline has certainly hastened, um, hastened this. And even prior to the crisis, half of all mall-based department stores were expected to close by 2025. And then there's online. The story here is that physical stores and e-commerce, uh, they really work together. 80% of online sales take place within close proximity, uh, proximity, excuse me, about 20 minutes of a brand's physical store. When a store opens a new location, online sales from nearby zip codes rise. Uh, recently, online sales had accounted for 15% of total retail sales in the U.S., which means that 85% was still occurring in physical stores. 
but uh, this this crisis has has definitely increased the percentage of online sales. Not a surprise uh, to about 25% of all retail sales. That's a decade's worth of change in just a few short months. So moving on to uh, smaller retailers. In recent years, the smaller independent operators have been taking smaller spaces. Um, a lot of the big retailers have been doing the same thing. Um, they just don't need as large of a footprint. Uh, many small operators have also been co-locating with synergistic uses, um, sharing a space uh, with other like kinds of operators or operators that kind of fit together with them. Um, and because single use spaces are becoming more and more obsolete and just generally uninteresting to consumers. Retailers are also signing shorter leases than they did in the past, and many are negotiating for percentage rent only or deals where they pay a lower base rent with uh, an added percentage rent. Here's an example from Seattle of co-locating. This is an operator of a small neighborhood specialty marketplace slash coffee shop slash wine bar and a women's apparel and accessories boutique. There's a large sliding barn door between the two spaces that's open when they both have open hours and it's closed in the early morning and evening hours when just Conan Steiner, the, the marketplace, is open. And here's a longtime operator on the Oregon coast that commingles a hardware store with a bar and grill. So you can buy a hammer and then drink down a screwdriver. This is an operator that serves coffee and pastries in the early morning. They offer simple lunch fare. Uh, they have beer, wine, as well as kombucha on tap. And they uh, sell a really carefully selected grouping of locally made products. So they mix up a number of uses all in one space. Shinola in Detroit, uh, in their Detroit store, they brought in a local florist to set up shop in their space for a couple of years. And in their store in Brooklyn, they partnered with a local restaurant operator all in one open space. So what's on people's minds when they visit a store? Well, about half the time, it's very task-oriented and efficiency-focused. But the other half of the time, people are in the mood to discover, to be social, to dream or be entertained. We visit retailers for a number of reasons, and often it's about human connection and belonging. Uh, many also just feel really good about supporting local businesses. It's also because people trust that store owner or buyer. They could scan from thousands of dress options online, an often overwhelming process, or they can go to that store and choose from a few dresses that were carefully selected by that operator that met their standards for style and fit. So moving on to a very quick take on the restaurant world. Uh, between 2015 and 2019, we uh, Americans spent more money dining out than we did in grocery stores. This was the first time that had ever happened. We've definitely become a culture that eats, eats out. Um, before the crisis, uh, a number of trends were well underway. Um, of course, mobile food operators have been around for some time and have been thriving. Food halls, the kind of cooler new version of food courts of old, have been on the rise in cities across the US. And two trends that have been really skyrocketing since the crisis are in food delivery, uh, as well as with virtual kitchens and with ghost kitchens. So moving on to section two, which is kind of about survival uh, given this crisis. And keep in mind, it's not one size fits all. Uh, you really need to reflect on what's possible for your business and then take action from there. So, this first one uh, is really a given from masks to barriers to limiting entry. The key is to make sure that you're following your local guidelines and requirements for ensuring the safety of your team and your clientele. Very critically, it's gonna be important to communicate your protocol to customers so they feel comfortable coming into your business. This means putting that information on your storefront about what your protocol is, uh, putting it in your social media posts and very prominently on your website. You might even consider doing a short video to show customers exactly what you're doing with your space and your team. They're really gonna to wanna to know these things. 
uh, with face masks, um, I think it's great if you can try to have some fun and let your team members really show their personality. It's a little bit odd to be in a, in a restaurant or a store where everyone's masked, but if you um, have, have your team members wearing really fun decorated ones, that can very much soften that effect. And if more than face masks are right for your business, there are some very reasonably priced face shields out there, including ones that clip on to baseball caps like you see in the photo at right. Or you can go the DIY route and make them with clear plastic sheet protectors and headbands. Um, those kind of hard plastic U-shaped headbands work well for this. Some eateries have installed clear shower curtains between tables to enhance safety. That might be an option for your business. And here's an example of a salon that has installed plexiglass barriers between stations. These kinds of interventions should really go a long way in making customers and your team feel more comfortable. And here's another example of barriers to offer protection uh, here using the kind of tubular plastic fittings and clear sheets of plastic, uh, relatively, relatively inexpensive fix. Uh, and one more. One more example of a similar intervention installed in a restaurant. Um, if you haven't already, um, this is kind of the third or second area, excuse me. Um, if you haven't already been using social media to connect with consumers, it's really high time to do so. You wanna think about who your core customer is and choose the channels accordingly. For example, if your product or food offering mainly appeals to teens and say the early 20s crowd, then TikTok might be the right uh, platform for your business. Instagram can be great for just about any business. Uh, this example shown here on this page is a small independent grocery store on Maui that's been around for about 65 years. They post every day simple little things and they get people in the door as a result. Uh, in terms of content, for, for many businesses there's not a need to worry too much about having to create anything super polished, really simple clear photos and simple videos from you and your team or from frequent customers can be highly relatable and effective. As for websites, if you have one, great. Uh, you might wanna take a look at it and see if it's time to enhance or improve it. If you don't have one, build one now. It can be very simple for a restaurant, you know, making sure your menu's updated, photo, a few photos and a little bit about your restaurant. Uh, for a store, a little more complicated, um, certainly and time consuming putting up your, your product, um, but you really do need to be sure to have the ability to sell through your website. It's, it's been really important for a number of years and clearly this crisis has shown us that even more so. There are many great platforms out there for doing this. Um, it's a matter of taking a look at them and deciding which is right for you. Um, there's gonna be a few examples coming up. Um, there's just um, a little bit more about the online world. There's so much going on in this space. And I'll talk really just about these first two bullets here, which are, is about claiming your business on Google and on Yelp. If you haven't already done this, it's really important. These are the places that so many use to search for stores, products, and restaurants. Uh, by claiming your business, you are then able to control what's displayed about your business in terms of your operating hours. You can post photos, upload your menu, uh, and very importantly, if you've claimed your business, you are then able to respond either publicly or privately to reviews posted by customers. So there's really a, a lot more detail around e-commerce and social media um, to go into, and that's gonna be covered in some upcoming webinars that the Golden Triangle uh, will be telling you about. Um, they'll also distribute a PDF with links to what's shown here on this page, so you can check these things out. Even if you don't use some of these platforms, um, several have really great blogs and uh, post, post interesting information, helpful information for small businesses. So I definitely recommend looking into them. So the next part is about re reviewing and adjusting your offerings. Um, for retailers to start, you know, take a look at what your products are and what your offerings are and think about what new products might be a fit. Uh, in particular, um, items that are being termed new essentials are selling well and expected to continue to do so. These aren't the necessary things like toothpaste and toilet paper, but they're also not quite non-essential items. They're the things that allow people to learn or refine a skill, to be creative, and that entertain. 
and especially products in beauty and wellness. That's a category that was super strong before the crisis and has continued to be logging great sales. So think about what things might be right for your business to add to your, to your product mix. For uh, restaurants and eateries, um, of course, they're tweaking their menus to focus on higher margin offerings. Um, in addition to takeout meals, some are offering basic things like eggs and fresh vegetables. Uh, you want to make sure that your customers know that, what kind of desserts you offer so that you can increase your spend per order. Um, and you may look into the possibility of bottling or packaging the your best sauces, uh, spice blends, and other staples and things that are your own special recipes. That can be a great source of additional sales. The example on this page is um, from a restaurant in Seattle, Marination Station, and they use a, a specialty sauce that they've made on a lot of their items, and it's called Nanya Sauce. They bottle and sell that. They sell a lot of it. Uh, the name is kind of fun. It, it, it means that the Nanya comes from Nanya business, what's in it. Um, they, they don't quite give away the full secret of, of the ingredients, but um, it really is uh, an effective way for, that they have found to boost their overall sales. Uh, another thing is that you, if you don't currently have any logo merchandise, you might want to consider getting it. Many people really enjoy purchasing and using baseball caps or coffee mugs from their favorite businesses. Um, and the last is that for some eateries, partnering with a local grocery store to carry prepared meals is another good revenue stream. So that might be something to look into and see if it can work for your business. So even as um, business is going back to some semblance of normal, distance restrictions mean less people at a time and a space. And a good number of consumers remain wary of going into stores and eateries. So continuing to reach them in alternative ways is gonna be really important for the foreseeable future. That's everything from video and online shopping to, of course, curbside pickup and more. Uh, retailers can be successful. Also at pulling together gift sets for various occasions uh, and mailing those out. And some are also partnering with restaurants to put together baskets that would have food items as well as non-perishables. And of course, you wanna be using social media to promote these gift sets. And you might uh, want to look into incentives that you can offer your customers. Loyalty programs really do work. If you don't already have one, you may explore whether this might be right for you. You could come up with a simple punch card offering, or you could use a resource like Marcello that allows you to customize offerings by customer for sales that take place both in your store and online. Another option might be a membership model. I know several boutiques that offer a percentage off for the rest of the year when a customer spends a minimum amount in January. Uh, during this current crisis, there's also a store in Portland that gave 20% off merchandise for the rest of the year to customers that spent $500 from April through mid-May. The, the thing is that once you have these folks join as, as members, then they come to you first when they need something, um, either for themselves or for a gift. Uh, so, more and more uh, single use spaces are becoming obsolete. So you might consider if subleasing a portion of your space could be right for your business. As the earlier examples of co-locating show, it can really create great energy to have more than one use at a time to draw in customers. And in these unprecedented times, uh, a good number of landlords are working with their tenants on rent relief. Um, they, as they see it, less rent is better than none. Um, that would happen if their operators fold. I know some landlords have provided immediate relief in the form of abatement for the last few months. Um, others have deferred uh, several months rent to the end of the lease term. And many are also looking at how they needed to extend the relief with discounted rent going forward. So if you haven't yet been successful negotiating with your landlord, uh, as well as with suppliers, then don't give up. It's worth, it's worth continuing to try to do that. And this last um, item is about enhancing, improving, and refreshing your, your business, and that is the subject of the next section. So to sum this last, this, this current section up, uh, beyond the need for safety protocols, it's time to think very broadly about your business, how you can take it in a new direction, and also to ensure, to, uh, ensure you're taking advantage of the technologies and platforms that help you reach and interact with consumers. 
Again, there'll be additional webinars coming up that will go into great detail about how to select and deploy these kinds of tools. So I highly recommend you tune into these. So in section three, um, I'm gonna be talking about design, look and feel and branding of your business. Before I start, I do need to acknowledge that the design and environment aspect of your business is just huge. I'll touch on a number of key details, but this is by no means an exhaustive, uh, exhaustive tutorial. Yet I do hope it compels you to take a look at your business with fresh eyes and aim to make some tweaks to boost your foot traffic and sales. So again, there is so much that goes into the environment and experience around your business. Everything from signage to lighting to interior layout and flow, even the music you play. And the key is to put thought into each of these aspects to be very intentional with what you're doing. The goal is that collectively the elements create a place that creates memories that people want to share with others and that's highly repeatable. So I like to tell operators I'm working with to think of your storefront like a well-wrapped gift. Just by its packaging, you know that there's something special inside and you can't wait to open it. Similarly, you want your storefront to get attention and beckon people in the door. This is a series of very thoughtfully designed storefronts that really do catch people's eyes and attention as they're out and about. These are all distinctive, inviting, and memorable. In contrast, this is a series of storefronts that's pretty ho-hum. The operators haven't put much, if any, thought and intention into their branding, and nearly each has a multitude of extraneous signage that just serves to create visual clutter. But does it really make a difference? Yes, it does. <laughs> Rigorous observation from retail anthropologists on the behavior of people as they walk along city sidewalks has shown that you only get about three seconds to catch their attention as they pass your storefront. The goal is to catch that attention, get more people to enter your storefront, and therefore make more sales. And again, here's a series of compelling, eye-catching storefronts. I especially love the one at um, bottom right, the restaurant. They've very cleverly used paint to create a simple and attention-getting look. Here are two similar types of businesses with the one on the left, uh, very thoughtfully designed and tidy, uh, well-maintained, while the one on the right is just entirely cluttered up with an overdose of signage. And here's another side-by-side, -side, this time of two small marketplaces. Again, the one at the left has an intentionally designed and maintained storefront, while the one on the right looks pretty generic and it's very cluttered with signage. And here are two similar um, kind of garden uh, outdoor stores. The one on the right uh, has a very dirty awning and a pretty sad and faded sign, um, windows that are, are quite cluttered, where, while at left, the business has a simple and colorful sign, uh, very noticeable, a well-maintained storefront, and the bright green interior walls draw your eye in. Uh, this example shows uh, the wonders that just a little paint can do to highlight a restaurant at the base of an office tower. And window decals are also a very fun way to give character to a storefront at a pretty affordable price. I especially love the one at the right uh, with the combo of the paint on the brick uh, and then the decals on the window that evoke a big splatter, uh, drop of paint splattering. This is a restaurant in Vancouver, BC. Um, they've used a window decal to frame in what would otherwise be a somewhat bland storefront. Uh, the pink bicycle with a flower basket out front creates interest and gets attention in front of this store. And just like moths to a flame, we really are attracted to light. So ensure that you're lighting up your storefront well to get attention. Even stores that might not be open at night should make sure that they have well-lit windows to get notice and just plant that seed for folks to return during open hours or to shop in the store's online store. 
uh, windows truly are still one of the store's best forms of advertising. This is a restaurant that's in a fairly bland looking um, space due to a, a storefront, that, that metal storefront system, and also really near zero branding besides having a sign. So we suggested that they put out a, just a cafe table and bright planters. Once they put these up, they had people coming in and asking if they had just opened, when in reality, they'd been open at that point for a year. Um, many of the new customers were so surprised by that, they said that they passed by several times a week and had never noticed the business. So these things really do matter. Um, these, these little cafe tables and planters can be left out year round, even if weather doesn't allow for outdoor seating, uh, because it is eye-catching and does create a more warm and welcoming feel. But even retail stores can put seating out in front and um, make the store seem more friendly and inviting. Here's a, another uh, example of that metal storefront system, um, this time with a retail store. And um, just by painting those bottom panels in her signature red color, it really takes the storefront up a notch and gets more notice. Um, this shows how a simple, inexpensive tweak can make a big impact. And she also did a great job with her blade sign, which leads to the next section, which is around signage. Um, signage is just another critical factor for your business. You want to ensure that they're very visible and readable and in a material that fits your brand. Try not to overdo it. You want to keep your store's name to just a few places, a main one that facing, faces out, a blade sign, and maybe a smaller one on your door. Of course, if you're on a corner, you're, you do need to have signage on both sides of the storefront, so that would increase the number of signs a bit. And this is the series of very thoughtfully designed and, and well-branded signs. Um, several of these, as you can see, are, are perpendicular or blade signs, which catch the eye of people as they walk up the sidewalk or pass by in vehicles or on bikes. So those are really important too. So um, overall, you really do wanna keep your signage besides your, your store name to a minimum. Um, you should certainly put up your hours and restaurants um, need to have their menus in their window. You can post um, your website and your phone information, but these can be quite small as most people are just gonna look those things up. You don't need to put credit card signs on your windows. People expect that you take these. Uh, the exception would be if that you're a cash only business, then you do need to tell people this on your storefront. Neon open signs should really be unnecessary. They're visual clutter and folks should be able to tell that you're open by having a properly lit storefront. Uh, and finally, if you have a sandwich board sign, make sure it looks good. So here uh, is an example of a couple of pretty blah looking sandwich board signs. And this one's in terrible condition. It really sends negative signals about the business. Here are two examples of very simple, stylish looking sandwich board signs. I especially have always loved the, the one on the right, the dress that's out in front of an apparel store in Portland, Oregon. Uh, here's a very simply designed storefront um, with a well done sandwich board sign, which is great. But in this picture in particular, I wanted you to notice the planter uh, on the bottom left that has a very sad looking, almost dead plant in it. If you're gonna have a planter, then please, by all means, make sure that you uh, make sure that your plants are, are healthy looking and look good. It's better to not have a planter at all than to um, have a dead and dying plants in it. So in this photo, uh, the thing to note is the menus that are taped up to the window. Uh, taping, taping things up to the window just really looks messy and um, you can always see the tape and then it also tends to leave behind residue that's hard to clean off. So a very simple fix for this is using uh, suction, the clear suction cup hooks and you punch holes in your signs and menus and hang them off of those and it just looks so much neater and tidier. Um, another great way for restaurants to display their menus is using a, a board and hang, hanging that in the window it makes it easy to, to change out uh, as you change your menus as well. So um, Paco Underhill is a cultural anthropologist and he and his team at EnviroCell have studied shopper behavior for several decades. 
Uh, so a lot of what we know about what compels people to take notice of a business and walk in the door comes from his work. This quote um, is just entirely spot on. If you have great merchandise, but it's not well displayed, it's just not going to sell very well. And conversely, even so-so product can really sell if it's well displayed. So um, moving on to Windows, um, again, really important. They're such a terrific marketing tool. Uh, you want to start with great lighting and you want to make sure that you can light things from the front and the sides, not just from above, um, because if you only have lights coming from above, it can cast pretty harsh shadows on your product. You want to try not to put too much in the window display or it can get very busy and unfocused, which is just not attractive to the eye. And um, be careful of putting product too low in the window. You want to keep people's eyes up to where more of the product is. You also want to try to keep props to a minimum and feature just mostly what you're selling. Now, you know, to, to, to everything, there's always some exceptions. Um, and while th these things are true for just about every um, store, uh, in particular, the thing about props is going to vary a bit. If you're a jewelry store, your product is so small and therefore you really do need to use props to kind of draw attention to the window and highlight things and, and show change out color wise and different things uh, just because of the nature of that product. But for most operators, um, they really don't need to be using many props. So. Last year, I worked with this store in Iowa City. It's an outdoor apparel and gear store, um, somewhat of a local version of an REI that's been around for a few decades. Uh, they were in need of a simple refresh, largely focused on their displays and the flow through their store. Uh, and this was the window display when I got there. And just a couple of things to note that there isn't much of a focal point to draw the eye. Um, it's just kind of things are a bit seem a bit scattered across the window and those large duffel bags that are down low at the front, uh, front bottom kind of left, um, they really draw your eyes downwards rather than keeping them up where the other product items are. So here's the window um, that we did to, to make it more focused with the mannequins sort of centered better, pulled together more tightly to create more of a focal point. They're also at varying heights and varying depths and the duffel bags are pulled up and connected, better connected to the display in that center pane. So a much more focused grouping of things that does a better job of creating a focal point drawing the eye. Uh, then there was room on the left to do a grouping of yoga wear items, which they um, tend to do pretty well with and hadn't been featuring so well in their storefront. So um, this window display does not have a focal point as the merchandise is really scattered rather than grouped tightly. And what mostly grabs the eye are the white snowflakes, which are actually props. Um, the banner sign behind the store name makes things really cluttered as well. And they uh, also, it seemed like they had a color theme with the kind of blues and greens and the lavender going on those softer tones, but then they really blew it with the red and black piece that's hung on the wall. And you contrast that with this more tightly grouped uh, mix of product, um, more focused display. It's got a consistent color theme, of course, with the really being focused on white and just overall has a far more of an impact visually. It's a very simple um, window display of apparel and jewelry that allows you to see into the store and be enticed in because of the amount of product that they have, uh, which is also nice. It's very well lit and nothing is too low in the window. This is a hardware store in San Francisco. Uh, they get a lot of attention for the really creative windows that uh, window displays that they do. Um, often people go by just to see what their windows are and you know, then they tend to walk inside as well and make a purchase. So now moving to the inside of the space. The key is that you, the more you slow a shopper down, the more they will discover. And the longer they stay in a store, the more likely they are to make a purchase. Um, and that's because non-buyers, um, this is from a lot of observation of the years, but non-buyers spend less than three minutes in a store. So if you can keep folks in longer, it's more likely that you're going to make a sale. And how do you do that? So there's a number of ways. Um, so one is that uh, that area just inside the entrance is called the decompression zone. Um, when people are walking out on a sidewalk, they're walking at a certain speed. 
when they step inside a store, it takes them a while to adjust their pace downwards. So stores can force them to slow down um, by putting a display piece in the way, basically, just not too far in from the entrance that forces people to that slower speed and forces them either to engage with that display or to the move to the right or the left rather than just move quickly by all the displays. And to show an example, um, a specific example of before and after that, this is that same retailer from Iowa City. This is how they had laid out their main floor. Um, that green carpeting is what you enter onto. So what you don't see is this basically the door at the, at the front end of uh, that green carpeting. So when you would enter, you would just step onto that carpeting. You could easily uh, walk quickly back to, to the back before you slowed down to that interior speed. Um, and what we did was we moved some display tables right into the middle of the aisleway to slow down shoppers. So now people have to, well, one, slow down and maybe take a look at this display, but also move to the left or to the right in the store. Uh, in their store, they have women's uh, apparel and merchandise on the left, men's on the right. Um, and what they found is that now that they've done this, people are paying a lot more attention to the merchandise uh, in the front on either side in the store and they're getting more sales out of those areas uh, since people can't just so simply breeze straight down the aisle to the back of the store and bypass everything. Another attribute of how we shop, at least in the US, is known as the invariant right. We tend to shop the way we drive on the right-hand side. Uh, and that's 90 some percent of the time when we enter a space and to enter a store, we turn to the right rather than the left. So that right front area is a really valuable display space. And that should be changed out really frequently, even if you can't change out the whole store quite as often. Lighting is another really important factor, um, just as important as it is in the windows on outside, um, it's important inside too. You wanna be sure to um, vary your light levels throughout the store. Your aisleways can be a little dimmer want to really light up your product display as well. Um, you should watch for your bulbs as they age because they can tend to turn a sort of brownish yellow and unflattering color. Um, and you know, having a combination of up lights, spotlights, and tracks uh, will allow you to adjust your lighting as needed and really light up your display as well. And here's an example of a, a retail store where it's poorly lit. Um, the, one of the brightest spots in the store is kind of back at their cash wrap area, but their product displays, a number of them are just very dark, especially if you look to the back right in the photo, uh, that the display shelf is very, very dark and just makes it unenticing to folks. Now contrast that with a store here that's really lit up their interior very well, uh, makes it much more conducive to having people uh, want to linger and explore. Uh, with your displays, you want to um, mix textures to create interest and um, multiples of product also um, are, are a way to go. It, they really get attention in a way that um, just a couple of items does not. The exception here would be with higher end items where exclusivity is part of the appeal, in which case you don't want to put out too many um, items. Uh, you don't want to put anything too low as the majority of product sells if it's displayed between about three and five feet high. And please do not put anything directly on the floor. It really devalues your product. Uh, plus, people just don't bend down that low to pick things up. You want to balance your displays by varying the sizes of items. Um, and in general, uh, you also want to keep your lighter tones towards the top and darker at the bottom. That's going to create a more balanced display. And one of my uh, personal favorite merchandising truths is about odd numbers and asymmetry. So odd numbers and asymmetrical arrangements get more interest from people. Um, when things are overly symmetrical and too even, our brains process them very, very quickly. It takes us a lot longer to process asymmetry. So we spend more time looking at these types of displays. When you have loads of merchandise in your store, it's really critical to keep it highly organized. Displaying by color grouping can be highly impactful as you see here in this display. 
this is product in a hair salon. Um, of course, um, many barbershops and salons also sell product, uh, the products that they use in their store and, and products that they believe in. Um, it's a great way to increase their overall sales. Um, but in this case, the owner really wanted to increase her sales uh, and interest in her product. So what she's doing is painting the wall behind the display a bright blue that's going to um, draw the eye uh, because it's contrasting with the rest of the wall that's all bright white. Also, um, it helps that it's going to now make her product stand out better because most of her product is kind of a white white bottle, and so the white bottles against the white backdrop really just didn't stand out well. So uh, this is going to really help it stand out. She also, um, going back to that last photo, if you look down at that bottom shelf, she's got product on that lowest shelf. Again, just too low. Most people will not reach down that low to pick up product. So um, she's going to remove that product, not use that shelf um, because it's really just too low and, and put a plant down there. But also she is um, upping the, the uh, multiples of her products, so putting a lot more of each product out on the shelf and really filling that up to be more enticing to people. Here are a couple examples of great ways to display cards in stores, uh, much better than say a basket that people have to try to sort through. Lots of retail stores, no matter what kind of product they're selling, offer cards as they're an easy add-on to a purchase. But if they're poorly displayed, uh, the store is really missing out on that extra five or $7 sale. And fixturing does not have to cost a lot. Uh, simple materials like the rope shelving on the left can work great. Uh, the owners of the wine store on the right bought used furniture at thrift stores and garage sales, painted everything with a white lacquer, added some rails, shelves, and holes uh, to display the bottles, and it's really very effective. And I love wheels. You can add them to your big bulky display pieces um, so that it makes it really easy to redo your, your store when the time uh, comes for that, and, and which should be pretty frequently. So um, another uh, last kind of example, um, starting from the outside in this case, this is a poke restaurant um, in a small town in Washington, that uh, Washington State, <laughs> that has used the decals on the exterior to define their storefront um, and be more eye-catching. And then they've carried their look and feel through on the inside with a simple and clean design. It's got good flow as well. Uh, and that interior design is very consistent with the exterior. So be sure to think about how your exterior and interior work together as you craft your space or as you consider um, tweaks to your space. And little touches that make people smile or laugh, really give personality to your business, it can make people wish to return, make it, make it certainly memorable. Uh, this is uh, in a restaurant in Honolulu, the Cocoa Head, Coco Head Cafe. Uh, they have a very fun way to serve up the bill at the end of the meal um, using their vegetable using vegetable tins. This little cafe also has a lot of fun with their egg theme in a few ways, um, with their bill presentation in the card on the right, um, those the egg salt and pepper shakers, um, and little stickers that they put on things. It, it really does make it very memorable and fun. And here, a restaurant's put panda bears and empty seats around the space which makes it seem less empty in this time of social distancing. They're also pretty cute and fun. And a, a number of restaurants are, are using things like panda bears. I know some are doing mannequins or cardboard cutouts that look like people, um, inflatable, inflatable toys and things like that uh, to fill those empty seats. Another thing that some restaurants are doing is playing the taped chatter of a bustling restaurant to create better ambiance and kind of fill the space a bit when it can't actually be full with people. So the upshot of all of this is that there is so much, oops, sorry, let me advance. Um, there's so much competing for people's attention these days. So operators really have to put thought into every aspect of their business to create a compelling place for consumers to patronize. The COVID-19 crisis has no doubt been extremely rough for retailers, for restaurants and salons. It's accelerated some of the shifts that were already occurring with how people choose to spend their time and money. And some of these shifts could actually be helpful to small operators. So really you wanna shine a light, uh, shine a spotlight on your strengths as small business owners, assess and enhance your storefront and interior, 
consider tweaks to your product mix and your menus. And finally, be sure that you're reaching potential and existing customers through the various social media tools that are out there and through um, online platforms. And I think with that, we now have time for the Q&A section. All right. So I do want to remind everyone that we'll still take a few more questions for Kelly. So you can either submit them uh, via the question box or we'll also allow you um, to raise your hand and we can unmute you for that. Um, Kelly, the first question I have for you is, mm -hmm. we're reliant on foot traffic for a lot of our business. How can we attract more attention from people walking and driving by, especially if more people are driving these days? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the key things about the look and feel section, those things have always been true, but more so now, mm -hmm. right? So I think everybody really needs to take a critical look at the exterior of their storefront and do they have great signage? Is their storefront really well lit? What is the look and feel aspect of the exterior? Are there some things that they could be doing to better enhance the look and feel of their storefront and get people's eyes and attention? That's really what it's all about. It's, it's, it's always been the case, but I think even more so now, just very, very important, you know, think about, look, look at examples online as well, get some inspiration from what others have done and then see what you can apply to your business to light it up better, to, uh, to enhance it, to do something eye catching with color, paint, decals, that kind of a thing. Okay. The next question is um, a lot of the physical barriers people are installing like plastic sheeting, don't give your business the best look. Do you have any recommendations for how to make these barriers look nicer? Yeah, I think that, you know, it's it's tough, right? Because that is um, the case that they don't tend to look great. And you put all this time and effort into the look and feel in your business. And then you have to put in these things that are pretty unattractive. So the plexiglass sheets, um, I mean, I know even places like Home Depot sell like plexiglass so see if you can get those kinds of pieces and use that because it is going to be a cleaner finished look i do think that the shower curtain the clear shower curtain idea is kind of fun um people know that they're shower curtains um and right. so it's kind of this kind of fun aspect to have that hanging down in a restaurant or even in a, in a salon um so i i would see if that could be the right thing for your business as well um beyond that i i don't think there's too many other uh, options at least that I've seen so far for how you can create those barriers, have them look really good um, without spending a lot of money. The next question is, my landlord doesn't allow blade slimes to stick out from the building. What's another way I can make signage more visible? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, let's see. I think number one, I think you should lobby them and um, <laughs> have them talk to me or or uh, or do a little research, pull up a little research about the importance of blade signs and share that with them because it does seem a little crazy that they don't allow that. Um, but if that's truly, truly uh, what's going on, then you might do something where you have a, a lighted sign. You know, there are so many manufacturers or businesses out there that make well-lit signage. So, um, you know, having a sign that hangs in your window, perhaps it's a lighted sign in addition to your one that's up above might be the answer. But I would try very hard to lobby them um, and give them the information so that they understand how critical that is to your business um, so that people walking up the sidewalk um, see it before they even get in front of your storefront because of that three seconds, you know, it takes, you only get three seconds to catch people's attention as they pass by. So if you can grab their attention before they're right in front of your storefront to compel them to look towards your storefront, that's really important. So I, I would go that route first. I would try really hard to lobby them on that. Yeah. And then I also do want to mention and remind uh, our businesses that we are actually offering um, custom open signs that will print and have installed that are very bright and noticeable. Um, and we're also um, allowing for businesses in the bid um, the essential safety requirements sign. So if anyone needs either of those made, um, you can send me an email um, and I'm happy to help with that. The next question we have is how often should we rotate our window displays? Ooh, it's really great. That's a great question. And, um, you know, ideally, uh, for most businesses, if you can do that every three weeks, that would that's fantastic. I know a lot of operators kind of cut that down to about every four weeks. But I also know some operators that do it 
either weekly or daily. Now, it depends on what your product is, that you know how easy that is to do, but there are apparel stores out there that change out their mannequins every night. They put new outfits on them every night and they plan a week in advance, you know, okay, here's the series of outfits for the whole week so that whoever's on staff can kind of see what they're supposed to be doing that night. And it's part of their closing, uh, you know, job uh, at the end of the evening, uh, when, the, when the store's closing, it's part of what they do, get that ready. Um, and so the first person in the morning puts those puts that new display in and um, it's, it can be done daily, but you know, the, the more frequent, the better because people, especially in a district where the same people are walking by frequently, they see new things all the time that compels them to walk inside. So yeah, as frequently as you can is the answer. Great. And then the next one are, is what are some of the known restrictions of co-spaces? The, the known restrictions, uh, like known um, issues perhaps or mm -hmm. problems? Yes. Well, I think, you know, you want to make sure that if you're careful up front about, you know, who you're co-locating with, then you shouldn't have any real issues. I do think, uh, you know, security can be an issue if there isn't a way to very clearly block off uh, the two spaces. Um, in the example that I showed of the small marketplace with the women's apparel and accessories store, um, they have that large, you know, very large opening in between the two spaces, um, but they do have a big barn door that closes that whole thing off. It's, you know, eight or nine feet tall and, and completely blocks that off. So I think security might be the number one issue. Um, I guess if you were playing different kinds of music, that would be a problem. But, you know, again, if you're, if you're being careful about who you're co-locating with um, and selecting someone that really is a fit for what your business is all about, then it, it should be fine. You should just have one system playing the same music in both spaces at all times. Um, that's, yeah. that's good advice. And then the last question, and I'll also say that we can take one or two more questions if anyone has any more that they want to submit, um, is with the restrictions on the number of customers allowed in salons at a time, do you have any other suggestions for how to increase sales? And I know you touched on product, but I wanted to see if you had any other suggestions. Yeah, uh, that's a great question because I know that's very tough um, with, you know, for all for all of you operators out there, it's it's definitely a tough thing to have the reduced numbers of people coming into your business and in your business at a given time. Um, I think that even with salons, you can think about, you know, is there opportunity to bring someone into your space? Maybe they pay you a small amount uh, in rent to be able to use a, a small portion of your space upfront for product. And so you actually bring in a little more money that way. Um, think about partnering with other businesses to offer gift sets if you can. Um, and, um, you know, maybe there's a, a an apparel salon nearby and you can put in together a few gift sets, examples of things where you can put a scarf or a sweater together with some of your uh, product that your salon sells and see if you can partner up that way to increase some of your sales. Um, beyond those ideas off the top of my head, I, I can't think too much about what you could do beyond, beyond sort of, again, some of the uh, uh, examples of how to better display your product and make sure that your customers are aware of the product you have, you know, increase them, you know, put out a lot of your products so it just looks really full. People are more attracted to display areas when it's full of product. Um, so you don't want it to be too thin. And so think about, look critically at how you're displaying your product to see if you can increase sales in that way as well. And we just had another question come in for you. Uh, restaurants on our block have stayed open while we have We've remained closed, yet we plan on reopening. How do we make ourselves known that we're back on the market? Do you have any suggestions for them? Yeah, so as you're coming, um, getting ready to reopen, definitely in advance, be shouting that out. Um, so hopefully you are using the various online tools and channels um, and you can use social media, certainly post it on your website do a couple of email blasts to your um, lists of people that are already signed up for that. Um, get on board if you haven't already, get on board with Instagram and those kinds of things and let people know. Um, put up a sign. I think this is a case where maybe you do have a banner sign. You don't leave it up too long. Again, 
kind of visual clutter you want your business, what you're all about to stand out rather than a banner sign to be the, the thing. But I think in the first week, say, you maybe you make a fun banner sign that you put up that, that really announces, hey, we're reopened and can't wait to see you. Uh, just some quick, short message of that type. Um, yeah, festoon it. Maybe you do put balloons out, something. Do something yeah. fun, get people's eyes and attention. Yeah. And you touched on this. How often would you recommend that um, retailers and restaurants be in touch with their um, like listservs, their email address books? Um, is there too much contact or? <laughs> yeah, there sure can be. That can be a very tricky one. You know, I think that you certainly know more than weekly. I think, um, you know, any more than once a week is probably too much. Um, in some cases, maybe once a month is more appropriate. Um, you know, depending on what you're using, you may have the option as well of allowing people to choose the frequency with which they're getting emails or the kinds of emails that they're getting. So see if uh, the tools that you're using allow for that, for people to make that choice. Um, but I would say no more than once a week and, you know, maybe once every two weeks is probably for most businesses about the right amount. People will let you know if it's too much as well, um, if they're just getting too much. But um, the, the nice thing, you know, I guess a, another reason why things like Instagram are so helpful to have is because uh, rather than getting an email in your inbox, um, people are active in choosing to go and take a look at something like Instagram. So it's a less invasive way, I guess, of staying connected to people. Um, so just one more reason to really get on board with some of these other kinds of channels as well. Thank you. And I would like to thank you for your time today and your expertise. We have appreciate it. And as Kelly mentioned earlier, we'll put all of this information on our website. And I'm going to take a few minutes now to update on uh, phase one reopening in DC. As I'm sure many of you saw today that Mayor Bowser has announced that the district's stay home order will be lifted and phase one of the business reopen will begin this Friday. For more specific guidelines on businesses eligible to reopen and social distancing requirements for each business sector, please refer to the mayor's order, which will be posted today. Uh, it will be posted at the coronavirus.dc.gov website which uh, we will also link over to on our website, which is being shown right now. But I would like to just quickly kind of go over the businesses that can reopen in phase one and what it means for them. Retail can open for curbside and pick up at the door. Delivery may continue, customers cannot shop inside the store. Restaurants, Outdoor seating is permitted as long as tables are six feet apart and no more than six people per table for those who currently have approved outdoor seating. Curbside pickup and delivery may continue. Customers may not sit inside the restaurant. I do also wanna let you know that the city is working on guidance for outdoor seating for restaurants. Once that guidance and uh, the permit process is available, we will email that out to you. Salons and barbershops, appointments are, uh, customers may come only by appointments. Customers cannot wait inside for appointments. Workstations must be at least six feet apart and there may be only one customer per uh, stylist. Hair, hair services are the only services permitted right now. Nail services, waxing, electrolysis, and threading are not permit, permitted. The mayor's order also identifies circumstances under which childcare center and dentist offices may reopen and under what circumstances elective surgeries can resume. Please also keep an eye out to, in the near future for an upcoming email on the one-time PPE care packages for businesses reopening in phase one. Limited quantities will be available, so be sure to follow the instructions provided in the email once the information becomes available. All this information can be found on our website, which you can see on your screen right now. And I want to thank everyone for joining. Thanks. With that, okay, thanks, bye-bye.